the Federal Bar Association for the Northern District of California. It's a pleasure to welcome you here tonight to celebrate the release of Judge Alsup's new book, The Trial of Lee Harvey Oswald. Many of you know Judge Alsup from his beautiful pictures that grace our attorney conference rooms in our three diff different courthouses. But Judge Alsup is a Sierra historian, uh, an enthusiastic mountaineer and backpacker, and an accomplished and prolific writer. Today, we will hear him in conversation with Professor Rory Little discuss how he came about writing this book. We're pleased to have Professor Little join us today. He's on a sabbatical currently at Amherst, but he graciously agreed to come back for this. Uh, Rory has been a professor at the University of California Hastings College of Law for the, almost 30 years. Some of you may remember him when he was an assistant United States attorney here in this district. And some of you or many of you may know him from hearing him on KCBS radio, where he regularly discusses cases of import from the Cal Supreme Court and the United States Supreme Court. Before we start, I would like to welcome all members of the Federal Bar Association and encourage those of you who are not members to please join. The Federal Bar Association was started in 1920 to serve the interests of the court, to help the judiciary, the federal practitioner, both private and public, as well as the public. Regularly, our chapter puts on programs uh, that are of interest to the bar and the bench. Of note, I'd like to tell you about a program on November 10th, which will be uh, a webinar that we're co-sponsoring the San Diego chapter. Judge Anthony Battaglia is going to be speaking about Rule 16, Changing Tide in Expert Witness Procedures in Criminal Cases. And then on November 16th, here in this courtroom, from 2 to 5 p.m., we will have the Class Action Symposium with Judges Donato, who is present here today, Judge Tiger, Judge Kim, and select individuals from our federal bar, including Elizabeth Cabraser, who is present tonight. So I encourage you to go to those two programs. Um, I also encourage those of you who are law students to please join the FBA. Um, we, you are included. We have a special division for law students. Today, this program will be recorded and posted on the website for the Northern District of California um, Historical Society, as well as for the Federal Bar Association. For those of you who have not yet signed up for MCLE, please do so outside, and you will receive your certificate in a few days. I hope that all of you will join us and stay for the reception that will follow and get a hand, um, an inscribed copy of the book from Judge Alsop. I'd like to now turn the program over briefly to um, Kathleen Winters, who is the Executive Director of the Northern District Historical Society. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Randy. Um, I'm Kathleen Winters. I'm the Executive Director for the Northern District Historical Society. Um, a warm welcome to all of you joining us here today. Just a couple of reminders. Um, do sign the CLE sheet that Randy mentioned um, if you want CLE credit. And also, please remember to silence your cell phones if you haven't done so already. Um, before I turn things over to Judge Alsup and Professor Little, I would like to say a few words of appreciation to the others who have made this evening possible. Um, Kathy Young, the judicial assistant to Judge Alsup, who I know many of you know. Rowena Espinoza, the judicial assistant to Chief Judge Seaborg. The um, amazing 450 Golden Gate billing staff, especially Stefan Curl, who helped with all the audiovisual work here. And also our assistants, Alexander Murray and Valerie Stewart, who some of you met on the way in. We were also fortunate enough to have several volunteers from the judges' chambers and also from local law schools. So we're grateful for their help. And please, if you get a chance, give them a good thanks on your way out. Um, we hope you enjoy the evening. Please check your email in the coming days for information about upcoming events with both our society and the FBA. Also about opportunities to join um, our email list, also to become members, which is how we get these great programs going. Um, and also just to be in involved in what's going on now that we are all in a position to start doing things in person again. I think there's going to be a lot of interest and a lot of really 
pretty um, amazing things in the pipeline. And I know Randy mentioned some of what the FBA has coming up. We have a program on American Indians and California's history with respect to the local indigenous populations that's set for December 1st. We're gonna have a program on the 1945 UN conference and how that affects the way that war crimes are defined today. And that will be in February. So if you are a member or you're on our email list, you will get notified about those. Um, it's now my great pleasure to hand things over to the Northern District's own Judge William Alsop and UC Hastings Professor Rory K. Little. Welcome. Uh, so uh, Judge Alsop kindly asked me to say a few words, but I'm not gonna speak as long as he had asked me to speak, because you all are here to hear him and not me. Uh, but here's what I have prepared. Uh, and this is my sabbatical haircut, by the way. I'll be teaching in January and probably get a haircut. Uh, it is rare for a judge to write and publish a book. Even more rare is a book that is not a law a book, a legal guidance book or a horn book. And most rare of all is for a sitting judge to write and publish a book that is a good book. <laughs> uh, long ago, a sitting state Supreme Court judge published a pretty good book entitled Anatomy of a Murder. Maybe you've heard of it. Uh, like this book, Anatomy was based on a real Southern murder, based on a lot of facts, embellished with creative imagination. But that book was written before the author was a judge, unlike this one. Uh, and it's difficult to imagine an equal successor in the intervening 65 years. And you all, if you didn't already get a copy, I think you will get one, uh, and I'm urging you to read it. Uh, it's a, I'll tell you a little more about the cover in a second. Uh, Bill Alsup, who I still think of as Judge William H. Alsup, the title is intimidating to me as well as, uh, as, as an honorific. He is such a rare judge even more rare than the author who published Anatomy of a Murder. While sitting for only two years, that judge, uh, Judge Ossoff has been a prolific jurist for well over a decade, handling, as you must know, some remarkably well-known uh, and, and high-profile cases. Second, he did write this book while he was handling a full load as a US District Court judge. Um, and he has written a good book. I'm honored to be able to speak to him and to you on this rare occasion to both honor Judge Alsop, and to inquire a little bit about his book, The Trial of Lee Harvey Oswald. The Trial of Lee Harvey Oswald is in the genre of what we call creative alternative history, right? It's a history book based on facts, and I'll say a little bit more about that, uh, but it's creative. It's got a whole creative thing because, of course, there was no trial of Lee Harvey Oswald because Jack Ruby shot and killed Lee Harvey Oswald on national TV two days after Oswald shot President Kennedy. And the emotional impact of those events is hard, I think, for most people to imagine unless they live through them. And we'll hear a little bit more about that from the judge. Um, I also want to thank Randy Sue Pollack and the Historical Association. I see Robin Lipsky as well um, for uh, the Ninth Circuit Historical Association. Uh, those groups uh, only survive on the dues of their members, really. And I, I think they're worth uh, both joining and supporting. Um, Let's see. I'm going to uh, say something short, or as short as a law professor can. Uh, I probably won't say everything or even anything that Bill Alsop would like me to say. I'm offering not a critique, but just a brief taste about the book. And for a fair warning, there will be some spoilers possibly in our discussion. So if you want to read the book and find out what happens, uh, you listen further at your own risk. Uh, it's been 65 years since Anatomy of the Murder was published. Um, I'm gonna leave it to you whether his book is as good as Anatomy of the Murder. I think Anatomy of the Murder is one of the greatest books ever written. Uh, the movie version of Anatomy of a Murder, as you probably know, starred Jimmy Stewart uh, by director Otto Preminger and uh, musical director Duke Ellington. And that, understands, uh, that underlies our cultural understanding of the book. Um, and as I understand it, the motion picture rights for this book are pending. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's fun to imagine who may portray the figures in this book? Uh, maybe Bruno Mars for the music and Bill Ossoff would be played by who? Tom Hanks? <laughs> make, make, make your choices at the reception. Um, 
The trial of Lee Harvey Oswald is about a real case, or about a case that would have been real. It would have been the trial of the century had Jack Ruby not murdered uh, Oswald two days after Kennedy was shot. Uh, I'm going to make the assumption, at least, that everyone in the crowd has some historical knowledge and appreciation of those events in 1963. Uh, I think the judge may say a little bit more about that. Um, but if you don't have much knowledge of it, this book will be a good read for you. It's actually a quick and engaging read. It's not a laborious law review article. Uh, but it's also meticulously laden with facts from the 26 volumes of the Warren Commission report. I think this is maybe not all the volumes, but he's read every volume, I can assure you. And much of it is imagined uh, in its impact on the case that would have been tried. Um, it's called faction, not fiction. Um, it's a trial lawyer's book. So Bill also was a trial lawyer before he was uh, a federal district judge. Um, but you don't have to be a trial lawyer to enjoy it. On the other hand, if you are a trial lawyer, I think you're going to love it. Uh, it's written from the omniscient narrative perspective, which means to say you're going to hear what figures you're thinking all through the book on different sides, defense attorneys, prosecutors, uh, reporters, uh, investigative agents, uh, and, and witnesses. Um, so it gives you a full picture of, of the scope of the evidence, I think, in the case. Um, it is an evidentiary cliffhanger, which is to say you don't know what's going to happen until you get to the last page, frankly. Um, at the same time, it does explain some complicated legal jargon like the Brady Doctrine uh, and, and how to think about evidentiary decisions and strategy up and down. And even how judges think, and here you can answer for yourselves, how much of the book should we attribute to Bill Alsop as a judge? Um, he gives some pointers on, uh, on what judges think. Um, the book jacket, right, if you haven't looked at it, is, I think, pretty surprising when you think about it, because it says here at the bottom, a novel by William Alsop. It doesn't say Judge Alsop or the Honorable William Alsop, and it says it's a novel. Um, and and there, maybe you'll have more to say about that. The choice of calling this a novel versus other things, uh, it certainly is a creative enterprise, but the idea that he's not trading on his position to sell this book, that he's asking you to judge it on its own merits, I think is clear from the cover of the book. Um, what else do I have to say? Uh, you will have to read the book to find out how it comes out, but he's not a strategic slouch. He will lay bare for you many of the difficult choices that lawyers on all sides have to face. He even comes up with a plausible defense for Lee Harvey Oswald that is actually based on real, real evidence that he has uh, garnered from the record. Uh, there are some moments of humor. Uh, and for the cinematic version, there's even possible romance involving not one but two gorgeous women. Um, but he's not a romance writer, um, so he doesn't try to be. Um, he, he describes the patrons of a strip club. There's a strip club. Jack Ruby really did own a strip, strip club. Uh, as, here are the patrons as they're described. They come in with the Ten Commandments and a $10 bill, and they don't bre break either one of them. Um, James Thurber. Whoa, 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 whoa. That was about Baptists. <laughs> well, I don't want to bring about, the religion. They're talking yeah. about Baptists. <laughs> and, and Jack Ruby says, yeah, they come in with the Ten Commandments and a $10 bill, and they don't break any of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's just one example. Um, James Thurber, who was a humorist uh, a long time ago, and if you don't know who he is, you should look him up, wrote a sto short story once entitled, What If Grant Had Been Drinking at Appomattox? Um, that's uh, imagined creative alternative history. Uh, this is also imaginative creative alternative history. It's not as humorous as James Thurber, but it is more satisfying. Um, here's a plug from my hometown. Like the Philadelphia Phillies, this book has a little bit of everything. It's a championship book. Um, we'll see. Uh, it's got religion, patriotic humor, uh, a patriotic honor for the greatest generation of World War II, a discussion of junk science, a discussion of racism and racism in the South during a trial, uh, and even a little bit of philosophy thrown in, almost as an aside at times, like, I think this was a mic drop, when he has a character say, life is a perfect invention. Now, I don't know whether you can attribute that to the author or not. It's a great line. Uh, there's a wonderful presentation, this is the last thing I really want to say, about an imagined conversation with Percy Foreman Percy Foreman is the defense attorney. Percy Foreman was a real defense attorney who represented James Earl Ray 
He did not represent Lee Harvey Oswald. Nobody did, um, but he said he would have. Uh, and he has Percy Foreman deliver a soliloquy about the duty and honor of being a defense attorney and defending people who are apparently guilty. Uh, Foreman explains, and this is not until you get to page 275, so you've got to read there. Uh, he says, quote, we aren't the ones who will go to the death chamber. He is the one. He has the right, if he wants, to tell his story to the jury. And you'll have to see whether Oswald actually tells the story to the jury or not. Um, I think it may be a fault of literary critique to try to attribute things to the author. Uh, you know, he, it's fiction. So you'll have to see what you can attribute to Judge Alsop himself. Uh, but, but students of Judge Alsop, are there any trial lawyers for PG&E in the audience um, might want to study up on this book. Uh, whatever you think about that, you will probably like the man that it reveals. And now I'm going to turn it over to Judge Alsop. I can start with a question if you like, but it's what we call a softball, which is, how did you come to write this book of the many things you might have written about? And uh, how did it take eight to 10 years to get it written, published, and out on the street? Uh, thank you all for coming out and supporting this, this project. I very much appreciate it. Let me turn right to the question, which was, how did all this, uh, how did I come to do this project? In 2013, it was the 50th anniversary of 1963 and the Kennedy assassination. And one of the things I thought I would study that year was the Kennedy assassination, which I had not ever been a uh, student of. So I got the Warren Commission report, read it, and it referred to 26 volumes of testimony that the uh, commission had gathered. Uh, the testimony it was Q&A, uh, but it was also uh, exhibits, or photographs, for example. And I asked the library uh, here to, could you get me those 26 volumes? They said, well, it might take three or four weeks, but we could probably find a set. And I said, great. Well, that very afternoon, they came up with this very cart with 26 volumes on it. And they, they had an embarrassed look and they said, we're so embarrassed. We've had these in our library all these years, and you're the first one to ever ask for them. <laughs> now, I had so much fun filling out that little card in the back for each, each one, and, and I'm the first one and only one to ever check these out. I still have them in my chambers. Well, I read 24 of the 26, approximately. I, I, there, there are parts that I skipped over because they, but I read, and I was, you know, as a trial lawyer and now a judge, I have spent a career evaluating evidence. And I uh, was totally absorbed in these people from all walks of life, a, a cab driver, uh, a waitress on her way to work, uh, a, uh, a second cab driver, several police officers, uh, and, and quite a number of different people who were there uh, in Dallas that day. And I began to see, uh, uh, I, about halfway through, I began to see a possible defense for Oswald. Now I wanna say this, in my opinion, Oswald was totally guilty and the Warren Commission did a very good job. I am not a conspiracy type person. But as a good lawyer, I was a good lawyer, I could see a defense. And it got better as I kept reading. And I said, maybe there's a story here. So I, that's how I, that's the beginning of of this, the trial of Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, I need to back up though, because I believe there are probably some people here who don't know the basics. Give me one minute to tell you the basics. Uh, can I take that off? Yes. Uh, I'm going to use this map, this drawing. This is Dallas, Texas. This is Dealey Plaza. President Kennedy and his uh, motorcade came down Main Street. It was a tremendous outpouring of public support in a city they thought hated Kennedy. 
And they almost took it off the list of places he would visit because they were so afraid that he would be booed out of town. But it was the exact opposite. The people of Dallas poured into the streets. This is Main Street here. The, the, the motorcade came from Love Field, came down confetti, banners, turned right onto Houston for two blocks, and then turned left to make this final drive down Elm Street and the motorcade would be over and he was gonna to go to lunch at a, a big trademark. Unfortunately, at this window was Lee Harvey Oswald with a rifle and three shots were fired, approximately one here, two here, the second here and the third about here. And the second and the third shots hit President Kennedy and killed him. Um, he died at the uh, hospital at about one o'clock uh, in the afternoon. The, this, this all was a noontime uh, motorcade. By the way, this was the building is the uh, courthouse where Jack Ruby was in fact tried, uh, but uh, Oswald would have been tried in this very courthouse. Oswald was a, an employee of the school book depository. Now, what happened, unfortunately, is that uh, Oswald was killed two days later. I may not do this right, so forgive me, okay. Uh, two days later on the morning, Sunday morning, many of you are old enough to have seen this yourself, uh, Oswald was being taken from the police headquarters down to the county jail, which was that building that I said was the courthouse, it's also the county jail. And he, uh, a guy stepped out of the crowd of reporters and shot and killed Oswald right there. He died within moments. That guy was Jack Ruby, who ran a strip club called the Carousel Club. And he went on to be tried and convicted for the murder of Lee Harvey Oswald. So the premise of this book is what if at the last minute or at the last second, Ruby had been pulled aside by Roy Vaughn, Officer Roy Vaughn, who was the real officer there at the time, and uh, uh, who was supposed to be guarding the ramp down which uh, Ruby came. If he had stopped uh, Ruby, so that we would have had, it would have been quite easy to do. Uh, then we would have had the trial of Lee Harvey Oswald. I'm almost done with my long answer, but uh, uh, the, uh, in the, I, want, I wound up wanting to uh, say it wouldn't be enough just to say here's the case for the prosecution, here's the case for the defense. I thought it had to be, a, that, that might have been a good magazine article, but I, I wanted to write something that would help the reader feel like they had parachuted in to 1963 and was and were sitting at the elbow of these lawyers and investigators as the case unfolded and they did good work on both sides to develop their cases uh, i I'm not, I'm a legal writer, I'm not a novelist, uh, but my daughter is, and she gave me some good advice that I took to heart, and I eventually did a credible stab at a novel that will help you feel that you parachuted in, and you're right there with Abe Summer is the name, main prosecutor, uh, or Elaine Navarro, who is the assistant in the Dallas office, and they eventually get brought on to the state with the state lawyers to help try the case. On the other side is the famous Percy Foreman. He did say he wanted to represent Oswald, and, uh, but Oswald was killed before he could close the deal. So in this scenario, Percy gets the assignment, and he does a tremendous job. I think his opening statement and closing arguments in this trial are models of what I wish I could have done as a lawyer. I, 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 they're, they're really very good. 
Um, and his cross-examinations, though usually short, are right to the point of, of, of uh, what he's trying to accomplish. So that's the that's the setup. That's, I wanted you to uh, I wanted to try to explain to the public what good lawyers do and how they try a case, uh, so that and and to help them understand the true facts of the assassination, not the BS that you see on the Discovery Channel and CNN and Fox News that have these extremely uh, uh, conspiratorial. No, people come forward 30 years later and say, I was on the grassy hill. No, this, these are the people who are in these books, testified at the time in question, and were cross-examined at the time in question. These were people who uh, told their story, and that's what the, the, the evidence you will learn if you pay attention to it. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it had several purposes. I, I, I wanted to... I wanted you to feel like you're in 1963 and all the problems we had in the country in 1963 that uh, wanted you to see what, how the public to see how good lawyers like you would approach this case and try this case and what the real facts of the Kennedy assassination were. So that's, and it, believe me, it took eight years to write over many early mornings and weekends and I, uh, I did it, uh, I got really into it, and I really liked doing it, and uh, so I'm, gl I'm glad now that the, that the publisher enjoyed it enough to say they were going to put their money behind it. Okay, next question. I'm, I'm going to give you a chance. If you, if you want to sit down and take a rest, dude. I have so many different questions, and you all probably do too, and we're definitely going to have uh, question and answers at the end of this, uh, this show. Uh, one of my questions really is just my personal question. It doesn't say judge anywhere on the cover. It doesn't, did you have fights with your publisher about that? Did you think about this sort of thing? Did somebody tell you to take it off? Or? No, no, I did not want it to say Judge William also because I didn't want it to sell for that, for that you know, the main thing. But it does say on the fly leaf somewhere that I'm a judge. It so does. so uh, I, I, I didn't conceal that. Although but I, I did not want it to, I, I, just, I just felt like it would be better to just use my name. Well, let me just say it's very modest and humble in some sense. Um, and some people might not associate that with Judge Bill, Bill Alsop here at the courtroom. The well, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> but it refers to author William Alsop. It doesn't say, it, you know, it does say that he's a judge, but not, I think you got to get to the back cover or the back flap before you do that. There's, there's no picture of Judge Alsop until you get to the back flap. So uh, it, it, it's an interesting... Let me, can I tell the story the, about Bob Schieffer? Well, the first blurb on the back is by Bob Schieffer, the famous CBS... Uh, uh, a news anchor for a long time and faced the nation. I admired him a lot, and I wrote, when he retired long ago, I, uh, I wrote him a nice note, and then I uh, had no idea that I would ever approach him again. But he is a character in the book because he was there, uh, and in real life, he was the things he has said in this book, he did. Uh, so he is, but I didn't want to misrepresent him. So I wrote him another letter and I said, I, I've written this book. Would you read the parts where you come up? Would you, it's because if you object, I'll just take them out. And he said, oh, let me read the whole thing. So he read the whole thing. He said, this is great. This is great. It ought to be published and uh, I'll do a blurb for you. So that's how he volunteered to, to, uh, to do the blurb and he read the whole book and he's, he's still continuing to help me. Uh, uh, for example, he's... Uh, opened the door to me in some places in Dallas. So next year sometime I'll go down to Dallas to, uh, to help tell this story. So um, I, I guess I want to ask you first, do you have more pictures you want to show us? Well, the, uh, we can go through them quickly, but this is the main one. Okay. Would you like for me to show the others? No, it's up to you. Uh, this, uh, is your, this is your show. All right, well, let's, uh, uh, can we go through them? I don't know who's got the control, so here we go. All right, wait a minute, I gotta get the mic. This is the, uh, a real picture of the uh, Elm Street and the depository, and this is the, where the sniper's nest was on that sixth floor. Um, and this red building, it's a long lens, so that red building is, I think, called the Daltex building, and it is uh, on behind, it's actually behind the 
from the cars, you can tell that this was probably uh, probably in the late 60s when this photograph, I'm not sure, I, I see flowers here, so that might have been right after the, the weekend of the assassination, I'm just not sure, but, uh, okay, next picture. Let's go back to that one just for a second. Uh, sure. So this is, this is, um, this is the book depository. This is the window. Uh, this is Elm Street. Correct. And this is where the car is. And so there's the whole discussion in the book about junk science and ballistics and what it's, what it's like to make three shots from here. And I thought that was very interesting. Well, uh, yes. You, you didn't call it junk science. I, I did not. It. I did not. But it's not, I mean, it's, it's, it is quite clear that it was not easy, but it was doable for one person to get off three shots in the time that it took the, the car to go from point A to point B to point C. Uh, and, and all of those uh, wild conspiracy people who say, no, it could not have been done, and therefore there had to be somebody on top of the Daltex building, it's just baloney. It's, it's, it, could have, it could have easily been done. Okay, let's do the next. Uh... Okay, this is, I, I, we, I decided not to show you the Zapruder film because it's so, even today, uh, horrible. So, but these are f four pieces from it. And uh, the, the, this first picture is a, approximately when the first, as they turned onto Elm Street and the first shot was fired, which by the way, missed the car altogether. Uh, that's quite clear now, but at the time, J. Edgar Hoover said that it actually hit somebody in the car, and so uh, that that was a point of debate, and even today, people will debate that issue, but it's, to my mind, and in the book, you'll see the evidence is quite clear that it did miss. The second picture is as President Kennedy was hit in his neck. Uh, and he's realizing he's been hit in his neck. That was the second shot. He would have survived that, most likely. And I have not shown the frame 313, which is where his, he was hit in the head, and it's the awful scene. But this is a moment later when the First Lady was trying to, was, move, was, was doing what she's shown here, and that is a Secret Service agent racing to get onto the car to uh, protect her and get her back into the car. They, moments after, a moment after this, they raced off to the uh, hospital in, in Dallas. So ne next, uh, uh, we have just a couple more. I didn't have many. This Oswald was arrested within an hour and a half of the uh, assassination and they had him at police headquarters uh, in mid-afternoon. And this is the, that was the mug shot. This is a picture of Oswald that his wife Marina took in, in earlier in 1963 after he had ordered and received this Italian uh, uh, rifle. And it had a scope on it right there. And then he also had this pistol, which I believe is the pistol that he used to kill Officer Tippett. I didn't mention Tippett before, but uh, about an hour after the assassination of President Kennedy, uh, Oswald was walking along the streets in Oak Cliff, a suburb, and an officer stopped him, Dallas police officer, stopped him to inquire, and Oswald shot him four times and killed him. Now you may say, how could there possibly be any defense for that? Well, uh, <laughs> if you look, if you accept, yes, if you accept the premise of some of the earlier testimony, uh, that which is corroborated, then it's not so wild that there could be a defense for the murder of Officer Tibbet. Okay, one last, I think there's one more. This is Percy Foreman in, in real life. Uh, he died decades ago, but at the time he was one of the top five criminal trial lawyers in America, 
uh, he, he worked out of Houston, but he tried cases all over the United States. So I think that's, I think that's it. Let's go back to the, uh, the diagram that right here, the, the, leave that diagram up. Okay, next question. So, so um, I have some specifics to ask you about the book, but I wonder how much you would like to tell the group or how much you would like to say uh, to what me, I, I was seven or years old or something when this happened. The emotional impact of this event was not huge on me. Although I do recall that watching the funeral on television, I think most of America did. Um, but what was the emotional impact like on you? You were a young college student at the time and idealistic and this happened. So could, I, I think the book actually conveys, but not as well uh, as, as it might sort of the emotional impact of this. I think anyone who was uh, an adult at the time uh, was uh, devastated by it and confused because in, in real life, uh, Oswald was killed two days later. So we had the assassination on Friday and we were still learning the facts about that. This, you know, one fact here, one fact there over the national news uh, and also planning for the uh, state funeral that uh, we, uh, was gonna happen that Monday. And, and then suddenly on that Sunday morning, um, the assassin was himself killed, and you, you, it was it was hard to grasp. It was very confusing, and made you feel what is happening in our country. What will you know? Who will be killed next? And it was it was easy at that moment to believe there was a wide conspiracy. That is, that is true. Uh, you know, who could be in on this? That so many people could be killed, uh, two people killed in, in, in such a short time. Uh, uh, to lose the president, um, I think uh, President Obama had some, some of the same uh, feeling that uh, a, young, a young, dynamic uh, leader. Uh, we haven't had too many presidents like that, but John Kennedy was like that. Uh, he, he had a beautiful young wife. They had a, two lovely children. Uh, they brought uh, class, uh, elegance to the country, and especially to Washington, and the world loved them. The world, every, when, when they went anywhere in the world, they were heroes, uh, especially Jackie Kennedy, uh, who could speak many languages. Um, so to lose that in an instant, it was uh, it was a it was a crushing blow. That's uh, I guess the best way I can describe it, and a confusing blow. It took some time for us to. That's why President Johnson wanted the Warren Commission was he wanted uh, he wanted to help the country understand what had happened and so that we could uh, put our arms around it and, and, and grasp the totality of how that awful event had come to pass. Yeah, and the Warren Commission was, Earl Warren, the Chief Justice, appointed at the time a bipartisan commission, not just a congressional committee from one party in a sense. Uh, the, the enormity of that we haven't seen very often either. So, and, and really, uh, who else has been assassinated as a president? Lincoln, we can think of but I don't know that everybody here can name the other two, right? Garfield and McKinley, uh, they, they don't stand in our history as, as strongly as Jack Kennedy. Uh, and he was only president for really a short time. A let thousand ask, days, a thousand days. Let me ask you some things about the book. Um, and this is more about writing. I don't know, a lot of lawyers are sort of people who wish they could write a book if they could only write. Um, you wrote one. And there are moments in here as a trial lawyer when I'm thinking, I wanna hear what happened at that point, and you don't put it in. So there's, <laughs> there's jury selection, nothing about jury selection. There's uh, this weekend before uh, a cross-examination, uh, this is a spoiler, of Lee Harvey Oswald, and, and, I, and I'm sitting there thinking, just like everybody in the room might be thinking, what would I do during that weekend to be not just preparing the cross, but be preparing to be the defense attorney if I were the judge. There's not much discussion of that. And uh, what was the other one? Um, 
Oh, jury deliberations. There's no discussion about jury deliberations, and that would have been, uh, and we won't tell you which way the jury came out. So. Well, let's uh, go to the first one of, of those on jury selection, which would have been a huge, uh, believe it or not, I did have an entire chapter and a half. <laughs> and I got rid of it because I thought uh, it, it, it just added more pages to an already long manuscript, and I needed to find ways to, to uh, shorten it. So they, that, that chapter went out, but there was, I thought, one humorous line, because you know, jury selection in a capital case is not a funny thing, but, the, but the, uh, the, the, they were asking the prospective juror one at a time whether, uh, whether he would be willing to impose the death penalty. So the guy says, well, would you pay my way to Huntsville? Now, say so you don't know what Huntsville is where they put people to death in Texas. So he thought, see, so you don't even get it. OK. So, <laughs> the juror thought he was going to actually have to push the button. And he was willing to do it if they would pay his way. <laughs> so all right. anyway, all of that, that went on the cutting room floor. Uh, the, with respect to how uh, the, uh, the cross-examiner prepared for that cross-examination, uh, you're right, I don't have, uh, they're just two small little insights into his, uh, how he steeled himself for that day. Uh, one of them has to do with uh, Roosevelt's uh, prayer on D-Day and, and something that he had carried in his pocket uh, from the Second World War. These are, you remember that people who would have been in these positions were former soldiers from the Second World War. Uh, the, uh, but otherwise, the preparation is quite a number of steps that had taken place to get ready for. Like his going, he goes to New Orleans and he gets the employment file. This is the lawyer, gets the employment file for Oswald from the Riley uh, Coffee Company that made uh, Louisiana Coffee. Have you ever heard of Louisiana Coffee? Uh, you're such coffee snobs out here, you probably haven't, but Louisiana was a big thing where I grew up. And uh, so uh, Oswald worked there and, and he put some outright lies on that employment application. And that comes up in the cross-examination later on uh, when, when he's trying to show what a total liar Oswald was. Uh, so the preparation is spread out. It, there's, there's not a, I don't show him in his hotel room uh, putting the stacks of paper in little piles by subject, uh, which is the way most of us would have gotten ourselves ready. Uh, no, I didn't do that. I agree, I did not do that, but I, I skipped that, that, whole, that whole part. And then finally on jury deliberations, it, it uh, is left to be a mystery Although Jack Ruby tells you how it comes out. He's, the, he's in the final chapter. He goes to hear the closing arguments along with one of the striptease artists, a little Lynn, who was a real person, by the way. She died in Michigan a few years ago. Uh, a little Lynn, her, they go to hear the closing argument. And, uh, and, uh, and then she's worried that they're going to electrocute the wrong man because Percy Foreman was so good. Uh, and then Jack Ruby, he, he says, no, no. And uh, uh, he says it was his rifle and his gun. That's, and this is Texas. And basically it's as simple as that. His rifle, his gun, this is Texas. Now you have to read the epilogue to see how the jury came out. It's uh, inferred, uh, you can figure it out from the epilogue that uh, uh, how, how the jury came out. But there, you're right, there's nothing in there about the jury. Deli this is not 12 angry men, or, no, it's a different, this is not about the jury, this is about lawyers. Uh, okay, and so uh, the other thing that was uh, implied in a G-rated way is romance. Uh, 
but you didn't write too much about romance. And by the way, this is not a criticism because a book that knows what to cut out is better than a book that doesn't. Um, but what about the romance? Well, I had, uh, okay. Uh, uh, there, 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 were, uh, there were some chapters that got thrown out. <laughs> and I just decided that I was better at writing other things and trying to write about romance. So there are some hints of, uh, of uh, potential romance. Let's put it even more, more limited than that. But there is no scene where there's anything that would even approach a, a modern day movie type of romance, so. And so here's a more sort of uh, hometown baseball kind of question. The, and I haven't previewed these questions with the judge much. Um, so there's a fair amount of federal law enforcement, you know, prosecutors coming down versus state prosecutors. Um, and uh, I thought that was actually very interesting, this balance, especially for the Federal Bar Association, this balance between the federal prosecutors and the state prosecutors. Uh, what's your take on, on, on that? And by that, I mean, you want to tell us about what's your take about it in the book or, or in general, where does that come well, from? Well, I, I, I mean, through, I, I have known this for a long time. All of you know this. Uh, the local police and the state police resent federal lawyers and the FBI, you've seen that in a million movies, sweeping in to tell you how to run their case, right? No, they don't like that. And the federal people always think they know best. It really, you know, the feds think they have the best and highest standards, so they you know, can do it better. And the state people resent that attitude. And they, they should resent that attitude. So this is a little piece of the story. Uh, in the uh, early scenes, Bobby Kennedy sends our protagonist to Dallas, a federal prosecutor from Maine Justice, to be his eyes and ears. There's no idea that he's gonna ever get involved in the trial, but there are a lot of federal pieces to this case, a lot of federal pieces to the case and so it makes sense to have a federal lawyer down there to help the state prosecute the case. The DA was the famous Henry Wade. He was the, he was the Wade of Roe v. Wade, by the way. No, nobody seems to ever remember that. But uh, he, was, he, was, he had almost never lost a single case. Almost everybody he prosecuted went to the death penalty. Uh, he was a very good lawyer. And, and so he's the state. And so the feds show up. But there is a dynamic that goes on. You, it's over several chapters where you will see that the, the, the prosecutors realize and the judge realizes that it would be a big help to put them in as trial counsel as well as the state prosecutors in. So that you'd have an enlarged team. You'd have Henry Wade and his prosecutor Bill Alexander, who are real people, by the way, with the two fictional people, the guy from Maine Justice and the young prosecutor from the Dallas federal office. The young, attractive female prosecutor. Well, I think you read that into, the, uh, into it. I, uh, uh, maybe I said that. Uh, uh, I did. I, you, okay. Do you see the movie when you write this book? Do you see a movie? I do I say it would be a good movie, but I I know the enough of the real world. There's no way to there's no way that's ever going to happen. Uh, the the federal people wind up being part of the trial team, and and all and in the process of doing it, they're all good with it. There's no resentment because the Henry Wade comes to trust the judgment of these two federal prosecutors, and he actually wants them on the team. And uh, so that's, that's the reason they wind up getting onto the trial team. So that, it goes from being eyes and ears of Bobby Kennedy to being on the trial team. So I actually think we've said enough so that there's a lot of questions out there. So we'll just go a couple more minutes. But here's one that allows me to reveal something about you that you probably haven't talked about much with everybody in the room, maybe some people. So uh, you clerked for Justice William O. Douglas in 1971, I think, um, right out of law school. Um, 
would Justice Douglas have liked this book <laughs> uh, based on what you know is one question. And then, uh, and the other question is, do you want to tell us anything about what it was like to clerk for Justice Douglas? Because I find that most people want to, you, you don't know that many people who clerk for Supreme Court Justice and they say, well, what was it like? But would he have liked this book? Would he, would he have been able to read it? Uh, I think he would have liked it uh, because it uh, is an honest treatment of the uh, subject that has been so misconstrued in the popular press and popular media that uh, he would have appreciated that uh, the fairness of going back to the original evidence. And, and I think he would have thought it was a, 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 an okay story. I don't know if he would have put it on his list of best, but I think he would have said okay. Um, all right, this is the last softball, and then maybe we'll take some questions. Um, but I really wonder this. Was it fun to write the book, or was it painful to write the book? No, it was a lot of fun. There, there were you know, I got into these characters and the story, and I felt like I myself was actually, I had parachuted in to 1963. I, I felt like uh, I was there, and even though some of these people were fictional, I felt like I knew them as well as I knew anybody. And uh, you know, after several years of figuring out how they would have reacted in certain circumstances, uh, so I felt it was uh, a, a great experience. Now I will say this, I, I didn't think I would ever get it published. And my first effort failed, but then the people who did that uh, memoir that I wrote got interested in it. They, they had not been approached because they did not do fiction. And this is the first fiction book they ever did. So, so they, uh, they, uh, they liked the book. And I, so that, then my spirits went up when they, when they said that they would like to publish it. If you haven't read his uh, book, uh, let me, I've got the full title here because the full title is somewhat revealing. Um, I have it if I can find it. It's called One Over. Is that what it's you're... called? One Over, colon, Reflections of a Federal Judge on His Journey from Jim Crow, Mississippi. Right. Yeah. They, they published that. That's uh, New South Books in Alabama. And, uh, and they decided to take a chance on this Oswald book. Well, I think that's a great, that's a great book to read uh, as well. Um, should we take some questions? Should... Sure. How, how, now, are we recording this? Do you want me to run around with a mic? Um, just repeat the question. All right. Do you have any insight on what Oswald's hatred of Kennedy was? What motivated him? What, what was Oswald's hatred of Kennedy? What motivated him? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, now, do you mean in the novel or do you mean in real life? I was thinking real life. All right. Uh, I have an idea, but I, you know, it, it, it's hard to be anything more than an idea. Uh, uh, Oswald's hero was Castro. His alias was Alec, this I'm talking about Oswald's alias, was Alec Heidel, H-I-D-E-L-L, -L, as in rhymes with Fidel. And he he, he used that to buy the guns, that, that alias. Uh, now, at that time, the Kennedy administration was trying to kill Castro, and it was well, not, yeah, it was well known. There were newspaper stories he, in Dallas, uh, as well as, a, now it, it would, it, he used words like get rid of, or you know, you know, the people of Cuba should get rid of Castro. And the, and the Kennedy administration had used uh, even the mob to try to send uh, poisonous things to Castro to kill him, all of which failed. I believe that uh, Oswald knew all of that because it was publicly known and that that motivated uh, him to try to kill the president which he thought would then give him a ticket to Cuba. That's, now that's wild speculation on my part, but it's informed speculation. And it's yeah. true, I think, that he had training as a, as a rifle. Yeah, he, he was in the Marines. He tested once, uh, this is Oswald, he tested once uh, 
as marksman and once as sharpshooter, but never at the highest level, which I've forgotten the name of, maybe expert. There you go. John would know. Uh, uh, so uh, he did not, he did, he not expert, but the other two levels. Great. And the next question. Um, let's take this young lady here and then this young man. All right. I never went to the Dallas. Question, the question oh, yeah. is, did you visit these locations or was it all based on reading? Yes yeah. and no, yes and no. Uh, the, uh, once I started writing it, I did not go to, the, to, to this scene right here because I thought I understood it well enough. But I did go to New Orleans and went to the library that Oswald went to and went to his house, which at the time when I went, it was, it was still a ramshackle place and it was still looked like exactly the way it probably did when he lived there in 1963. It has since become a spiffed up lawyer's office. But, but in around 2015, when I took that visit, it was still a derelict. So that's, that, those are the, New Orleans and Dallas are the only two places that, uh, well, there's an opening scene is in, in Washington, but, uh, other than that, it's all in Dallas. So, and the judge spent two years, two and a half years working in Washington, maybe three. Well, at the main, yeah, where Abe Summer was located, but n none of the scenes really take place at Main Justice. But I, I, uh, I did work there for two years in the Justice Department at Main Justice back in the seventies. Next question. Yeah. Uh, Your I was curious if you read the Stephen King book, the counterfactual book, 11, uh, 23, 63, and your thoughts about it. I'm interested in what this Okay. Repeat. So the question is, have you read Stephen King's counterfactual history called, what is it? Uh, it's 11, 23, 63. 11, 23, 63, which I never heard of until this moment. Uh, so yeah, The answer is half of it. And it is a very long, uh, but very uh, interesting. It's based on the idea that this guy, I think he's in Rhode Island or somewhere, in the, and he goes through a hole in the fence in modern times, and it in, down this little alleyway, and he winds up in 1963, actually 1962, and and he he's uh, and, and he gets to Dallas. And he, the question is, can he interdict the course of events that led to the Kennedy assassination? And I'm, I think I'm up to about the summer of 1963, I, but I stopped reading that a long time ago. I, I, I got busy on other things, but it, it is a tremendous uh, story, yes. We're finishing, I will, I, I'll thank you, I will do that. Okay, uh, all the way in the back, I see a hand. Speak loudly. If you had a choice, would you have preferred to prosecute Oswald or defend him? Well, the federal public defenders here will be out of my case if I say <laughs> prosecute. Uh, I, I will say this much. It was an easier case to prosecute than to defend, as is probably always true in, the, in our courthouse. But, but these, uh, uh, yeah, the evidence was overwhelming against uh, Oswald. But the defense was pretty good. The defense is maybe <laughs> enough to raise reasonable doubt. Uh, so it's a good, it's not, it's all corroborated right here in these books. It's amazing to me that no one has seen this line of defense over all these years, but they haven't. And uh, so uh, there you go. If you read the book, I'll give you this advice. There's an author's note at the end that talks about what's real and what's fiction. Uh, don't read that if you want to just enjoy it as a novelistic account. If you want to sort of go through the book knowing sort of where the twists and turns might be, you could read that. Uh, that's in there. Why did you include the author? Well, oh, I, I, well, I tell you one of the reasons. That once I read a historical uh, uh, novel by Gore Vidal called Lincoln, hmm. and I and I, it was kind of a model for what I want to do. Although I never would pretend to compare myself to Gore Vidal, but. It was a tremendous book. Anyway, at the end, he has an author's note to readers, and it describes the 
extent to which everything in there was true. For example, he said, every person, uh, including Lincoln, was at the time and place where he placed them in the novel. He invented the, the, the conversation, of course, but uh, the, the people were there. He said there was one exception, and that was the, uh, he had General McClellan at the wedding of uh, Kate Chase, in the summer of 1863, and, and he was actually not at the wedding. He was had typhoid fever at the time. But he, for, but he admitted that. He said for literary license, he decided he would uh, uh, have McClellan at the wedding. Uh, and I thought that was such an interesting way to help the reader realize how much of the story was true. And that's what I was trying to get across in my author's note to readers, how authentic most of and I, then I say, well, here are the things that are fictional. So please re remember, this is not a history, this is fiction, but here are the parts that are actually verifiable. So, yeah. And that's even true of the dialogue, right? Some of the dialogue is your invented dialogue. Some of it is actual testimony from- Oh the yes, book. most of the testimony is taken from these volumes, but I streamlined it a little bit. Every now and then there would be, you know, how lawyers are, there would be too many questions and you could get it down to one question and one answer. All right, so I, I would, uh, I, that's what I did. But it, it, it did not compromise the, uh, you know, the essence of it. Made it better. Made it better. Uh, okay, uh, here's another question and then I'll look over there. Yeah, sorry. The, yes. the question is, would it have helped if there had been a trial? Would it have helped with the grieving process in America? Well, it would have helped. I, don't, I mean, we, we still would have lost President Kennedy, uh, but we would, have, uh, we would have better understood why. Now, the Warren Commission did a good job, in my opinion, of helping us understand that, and that helped with the grieving process, too. But if, the, uh, if there had been a trial, you know, it, it's the American way. We have two sides. We have a judge up there. Both sides get to have their say and ask their questions and present their evidence. And the, the, the people get to follow that. The press would have followed it. The public would have followed it. And it, but instead, we have a we wound up not having that opportunity, and uh, and, and and we have to resort to speculations. So I, yeah, I do think a trial would. It helps. Nothing would have brought President Kennedy back, so that in that sense, no, it would not have helped. But it, I think, in terms of moving on, it would have helped. There's a little parallel, maybe, to um, the bombing of the Oklahoma City Federal Building in 1995, was it? And yeah. Tim Timothy McVeigh. You remember there was immediately speculation. There was a big conspiracy, and the bulletins went out. Search for all the Arab American-looking people. And then they discovered Timothy McVeigh, who was a sole operator and a white uh, supremacist, and uh, had a whole trial. Merrick Garland was the prosecutor in that case, our current attorney general. And I think it helped people believe that the facts were as they were laid out because it was tested in the system with some good defense attorneys. So um, maybe that's a parallel. Uh, let, me, let me get this question and then come back to you. So Judge Alsop writes books all the time. <laughs> <laughs> this is called Missing in the Minarets. Uh, it's, in the, it's mentioned in the beginning of the book. It just says, here's a list of other books. Um, so that, the question is, uh, what got you to write about that topic? All right, Missing in the Minarets is about the search for Pete Starr in 1933. He was a lawyer in San Francisco, but a prolific mountaineer. He went missing in the High Sierra. And this is about the search that was organized that involved the famous uh, Norman Clyde and two other uh, young uh, Jules Eichhorn, who was Judge Chesney's music teacher in Burlingham Game High, and, uh, and a guy named Glenn Dawson of the famous Dawson Books in LA. Uh, anyway, it's about that, it's about that. And it, this is all true, it's not a, it's not a novel. It's all, uh, and, and I researched it, I came up with 
a lot of original. I was going to just do a magazine article until I found a treasure trove of material never before discovered. This was when I was a lawyer. I started this in the 90s, and it came out about 98 or 99, uh, just before I got this job. So it uh, it was a different pro It wasn't a novel, so it was trying to lay out the facts, but in a mystery way. But, and it is presented as a, a mystery of where could Pete Starr have gone. So uh, what was the question again? <laughs> Well, I'm a mountaineer of sorts. I've done a lot of climbing and mountaineering myself. And I, it's age 77, not much anymore. But back in the day, I was pretty good. And I knew that the Pete Star at story existed, but it was not very much published on it. And when I realized how little had been published on it, I, again, just to edify my own edification, I started, I went to the Sierra Club Library, and I hung out there for a while and read what was available and then did some research and eventually hit this treasure trove. And I said, somebody should write a book about this. This is pretty good stuff. And so I decided to do it. I'll give you one, just one sentence. I found the original roll of film that Pete had in his camera in, the, in his fatal trip. And I printed those pictures in my own dark room, which had not been printed uh, since 1933. And, uh, and here I am in the 90s printing pictures from the guy's last roll of film. Uh, I, yeah, it was a good story, it's a good story, but it, yeah. And have you been to that, you've been to the location? Well, I've been there, oh yeah, I've been to that location many times, but I had not climbed the peak on which he was killed. <laughs> Probably a good idea. Um, <laughs> there we go. What was the reaction of other students Yes, I, I, I get it, yeah. What was the reaction of other students when uh, yeah. he was in college in 1963? Yeah, this is one of the most disturbing memories that I have. Uh, uh, I, I, I was in the commons area of our dorm, and the dorm mom came out, and we watched the TV for a moment, because she was just dazed. They said, they said the president has been shot. And, and sure enough, it eventually, after about 30 minutes of watching it, uh, that's what Walter Cronkite said. Remember the famous, uh, when Walter in New York uh, takes his glasses off and says it's 1, I think it was 23 p.m. Dallas time, uh, President Kennedy was pronounced dead. Uh, it, was, it was, to me, uh, shocking. And, and I was heart sick, and uh, so was my, my dorm mother. But I w walked out, I heard this noise outside, and I walked out, and this was Mississippi State, remember this. And they were running around in random, ringing cowbells, which is what you do at Mississippi State when a touchdown is scored. And they were celebrating the death of President Kennedy. And that wasn't just one or two, it was probably at least a dozen students doing that, I, 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 it was, even if, even for somebody, if they hated him, still, you gotta respect the president. And, and yet, the, the, uh, that's how much he was hated by a lot of people in Mississippi at the time. So it's, I'm sorry to say it was not a good memory. There's, there's discussion in your book a little bit, I mean, to go to this sen sensitive topic of some racism uh, in the, in the courtroom process, let's just say, and also the uh, young, uh, I say attractive, federal prosecutor is uh, Latino, uh, and there's a little discussion of that. Uh, those are two different things. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, there is a, 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 a racism was, this was before the Civil Rights Act of 64. Uh, uh, segregation was, legal in every state really, unless it was, unless state law made it illegal. And so uh, a situation comes up in the trial. One of the most important witnesses is, is Amos Ewins, is a real guy, He's, his testimony is in these books behind me. He was a 16 year old kid 
uh, at uh, a local high school, and he was there, and he saw the final shot fired. And he becomes an important witness for Percy Foreman. Uh, he's African American. And Percy is worried in the book that Mrs. Ewens is going to want to attend. And now the judge had, and they had all decided they had to desegregate the courthouse because so many press people were coming from all over the world. So they had taken down the colored signs for the bathrooms and the water fountains, and they had, uh, and, the, and the courtroom gal gallery was open to anyone. But Percy Foreman, as the defense lawyer, is worried that the jury, if Amos Ewens is on the stand and his mother is in the courtroom sitting, say, with the defense people, that the jury will, will resent it. So he has to struggle, and so does his young assistant, who is, not, who is someone else. That's, that's someone named Karen that you're thinking of. And, and so they have to dis, they, and they have a big fight about this. She won't do what he wants him to do. And then there is a moment of truth when Percy Foreman decides that she's right. So, uh, but that comes later. And the, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, I think, a, a realistic trial lawyer decision that someone in that circumstance would have had to have made. Uh, and, uh, and they wrestle with it. And I won't tell you what decision they make, but it's, a, it's uh, one that they carefully consider. And I don't remember if this is in the book or not, but I have an image that the jury is all white. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, in that the era uh, I don't in know Dallas, if it says that. All right. uh, in that, I think it does say that. Uh, uh, it is all white. In that era, the, uh, the, the juries came from the voter rolls, and the voter rolls were all white in Dallas County, maybe not other places. Uh, they would have been Hispanic. The Hispanic uh, voters would have been in the mix, but African-American voters would very likely have been almost none. So they, uh, and, and that, was, that was true throughout the South and in Texas at that time. And I think there is discussion. I, I don't know which character. There's a woman whose last name is a Latino woman, and they talk about her father was killed. Yes, yeah, that, that's, the, that's the assistant prosecutor. Right. That's Elaine Navarro. Yeah. Uh, whose who's, uh, ancestry goes back to the Texas Declaration of Independence. The, the, the word is Tejano. Tejano is a uh, type of, Me of, of uh, not Mexican, definitely not, uh, of Texan, who was uh, uh, there, the roots go back to independence. And the, the Texas Declaration of Independence is signed by a lot of Hispanics. Navarro was one of the names on that on that uh, important document. Anyway, so, she she date her family dates back to to, to the, that that comes up in a, another point in the uh, story. The, the the point is that the book doesn't shy away from some topics that are uh, important today. I think uh, that's true. Yeah. That's true. But it views them those issues not through the lens that we have today, but through the lenses that the people back then would have, but this in this thing, again, go back to the young woman who's straight out of University of Texas who's helping Percy Foreman as his assistant. She's got views that are more like what we would think today. But Percy knows he's, he's more old school. And so they have a conflict there that is pretty heated at times. I think maybe one more question, maybe two, anybody? We, we've got time. You don't get the author again. Soon he'll be on the, the Oscar stage. Uh, we've got two questions, one all the way in the back and, then, and one here. Is that all right? What's going to be your next book? <laughs> What's going to be your next book is the question. I, I'm 77, and it took eight years to do this one. So let's see, that would be, that'd be a long time. Uh, I don't, I don't think I have another, I can't think, there, here's, I'll tell you there is one I would think somebody in this room could write, and I wouldn't mind writing it myself. 
It's a totally different idea. It's called Congress at its best. <laughs> we all know it at its worst, but, but, I, but if you go back and study the history of our Congress, there are some remarkably good moments there that deserve to be told. Congress at its best. And, uh, and I would like to write that someday, but I, I haven't started and I doubt that I could, I don't know. You know, the, at my age, it may not be in the cards, uh, Candace. But you can sign up uh, for a master class with, uh, <laughs> with the judge. Um, yeah, yeah. Jim. Teaching First Amendment law, we often ask ourselves, could Lee Harvey Oswald have gotten a fair trial in light of free trial publicity? What do you think? Could, could Lee Harvey Oswald have gotten a fair trial in light of uh, pretrial publicity? All right. Uh, I, I'm going to give you the answer in the book. In the book, uh, there's a motion to change venue. Now, by the way, in the, in the Jack Ruby case, there was also a motion, and it was denied by Judge Brown, who's the same judge in our case here. And uh, that was a very controversial thing. Uh, so maybe uh, they should have granted that motion in the Ruby case. But the same motion is made by the lawyers in our case, the Oswald case. But it gets traded off. Brady had come down in May of 63. So it was a brand new decision. And the lawyers make a deal. The government will turn over, meaning the prosecutors will turn over all the, interview, all the interviews for anyone having anything to do with Dealey Plaza and the assassination in exchange for two things. One, that that would satisfy Brady. Percy Foreman agrees to that. Second, that he will withdraw his motion for change of venue. Henry Way says that'll make it a fair trade. And he, Percy goes along with that. Now that's what allows Lee Harvey Oswald to see what's in, these, in, in here and to construct a story if he is so inclined, to that would maximize the curiosities and unanswered questions that come out of, the, the, and there are genuine questions to this day have never been answered. So I, I feel like uh, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, who's sitting in jail on the sixth floor of that building over there, uh, has plenty of time to read that material and to construct a story. And it's a good story that's consistent with all known facts. So, so here's my only critique of the book. The idea that the Department of Justice was so concerned about Brady that they would have thought it was a trading point <laughs> struck me as unrealistic in 1963, but that's just why I wasn't alive then. Um, do you get the last word, Judge, and then we're going to take our reception. So it could be just goodbye, or you could say more. Well, I, 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 I want to thank you for your show of support for this project. I honestly, I never thought this many people would uh, take this kind of interest, and it means a lot to me to see you all here. So I thank you for that. And with that, I oh, I do I am I have already signed today and yesterday a lot of the copies. But if you want it inscribed, I'm happy to do that too. I just will follow my orders on where I'm supposed to sit for that. And then in addition, there's a, a great reception plan, right? Why don't I turn it over to, to you? Why don't you come up here and explain our, our next few steps? And where the reception is, is it right outside? Yeah. Um, the reception will be just down the hall, right um, when you come out of the elevator, but where the, where the billboards and on the way to the murals. And then if people would like a personal inscription, if you could just meet the judge just right outside where the books were handed to you when you checked in, um, that would be great. Good. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you.